Years in Power and Between the World and Me. His latest book is The Water Dancer, which was his first novel and a number one bestseller. And I've been lucky enough to work with ta on all four of those books. Um, and uh, so I can choose ta Coates. Um, and with us tonight in conversation is Heather McGee, um, who is the former president of the inequality focused think tank Demos. Uh, she's drafted legislation, she's testified before Congress, and she's been a regular contributor on many news shows. You've probably seen her many times. Today was the launch day of her TED Talk, um, which I encourage you all to see. We're gonna talk a little bit about that at the outset. Um, she's now a distinguished fellow, senior fellow, excuse me, at Demos. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce her, Heather McGee. So thank you guys for being here with me. It's so good to be with you, Chris. Thank you. Um, Tanahasi doesn't care, it's fine. <laughs> um, so, so start, like, I'm you sorry. started out all solemn and everything, and now you're going to jokes already, right? This is what we're doing? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I thought we'd talk, like I just mentioned, this was the uh, launch of uh, Heather's really powerful TED Talk um, about uh, race and inequality. Um, and I hope we talk about a lot of different things tonight, um, but we're definitely going to, I think, probably touch on the subject of race. And it's funny because, you know, I think in times like this, in times of great national global crisis, uh, there's certain people who feel like, well, now's the time not to talk about race. Now's the time to uh, like focus on other things. Um, but, uh, you know, and, um, uh, and we saw an article by Andrew Sullivan just the other day who was kind of complaining about people sort of racializing what's going on right now. Um, but I think it's probably gonna intersect with a lot of what we have to talk about. So Heather, can you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about the talk that was released today? Namely, you know, you, know, you touch on a number of things from Montgomery to the, to the 2008 um, financial crisis uh, to issues of wage stagnation. Can you, can you just give us a little, quick summations. I think everyone should watch the full talk and then of course read the book when it comes out next year um, of what your argument is. Sure. Um, well, thank you. I, I just wanna say to everyone who's joining, thank you for taking the time out of your night. Um, thank you to the Apollo Theater and to our publisher One World and to you, Chris. Um, this, is a, this is a somber moment. I mean, it's just, it's just a tragedy. Um, what is going on in our neighborhoods and our communities to our people as black people. Um, and the idea that we should not be talking about the urgency of the crisis of inequality that this is laid bare is, is absurd. Um, because as I experienced in my um, nearly 20 years of working to address economic inequality and political inequality, you can't ignore racism. Because racism is the fuel that feeds inequality. And in so doing, it creates a fire that catches and burns and touches every house. And we are feeling that right now, very acutely. My, my TED talk this afternoon, um, that was uh, went live on TED.com is called um, Racism Has a Cost for Everyone. Um, and it is a talk about the main ideas in the book that will be out early next year um, called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And I tell a number of stories about the realization that I had that racism leads to bad policymaking. It distorts decision-making. It um, makes for a worse economy, a harsher society, a more punitive one. Um, it hollows out everything that we have in common. Um, and the central parable of the book and of the talk is uh, the story that happened in Montgomery, Alabama. That's the one that I talk about because I, I went and visited, but it happened in literally hundreds of towns all across the country and not in the South, not just in the South, where cities and towns responded to desegregation orders in the 1950s and early 60s and decided to drain their public swimming pools or to close their public schools and park systems rather than share that public with black families and brown families. Um, and in many ways, I think that's what's happening to our country right now. And that's what's been happening to our country since the mid 1960s, which of course was the last time that a majority of white voters voted for a Democrat for president. You've got 
to confront the fact that we have not yet figured out how to be a multiracial America and be a generous one. And the generosity pretty much stopped when it had to be shared with people of color. And so I think we're all facing um, the costs of that. And I think that those costs are not just contained, it's impossible to contain them to the target communities. Um, we'll always feel them the worst, but we will um, never be alone in the suffering from a society that is fundamentally ill. And that's where we are today, even before COVID came and struck. Right, I think that's really interesting because I think, uh, you know, when the crisis first started uh, with COVID, I think a lot of people saw this as an opportunity for us to see the ways in which we're all connected, right? To see that we're all like, because, you know, it could happen to anyone, it's a virus, it's almost like a, a natural disaster that could not possibly discriminate, you know, which is I think, you know, similar to what people thought maybe when Hurricane Katrina was coming into New Orleans, it's a natural disaster, but nature doesn't discriminate. And yet we see the ways in which um, nature landed in this case and in that case and many other cases on a system that was already in existence. And you know, one of the reasons I thought the two of you would be an interesting pairing for this conversation is because I was thinking about ta piece um, that he wrote after the election of Donald Trump called The First White President. And I just wanna read just a short portion of it because I was rereading it today and it was just striking me all over again. Like, you know, I don't think of ta is necessarily a writer who tries to be prophetic in any way, but there is a real prescience to, to what he wrote about the election of Donald Trump. Um, he described uh, the, um, well, first he says, it's utterly impossible to conjure a black facsimile of Donald Trump to imagine Obama, say, implicating an opponent's father in the assassination of an American president or comparing his physical endowment with that of another candidate and successfully capturing the presidency. Trump, more than any other politician, understood the balance of the bloody heirloom of white supremacy and the great power of it in not being a nigger. But the power is ultimately suicidal. Um, and then he writes, it has long been an axiom among certain black writers and thinkers that whiteness endangers the bodies of black people in the immediate sense, but the larger threat was to white people themselves, the shared country, and even the whole world. There's an impulse to blanch at this sort of grandiosity. When Du Bois claims that slavery was singularly disastrous for modern civilization, or Baldwin claims that whites have brought humanity to the edge of oblivion because they think they are white, the instinct is to claim exaggeration, but there really is no other way to read the presidency of Donald Trump, the first white president and American history is also the most dangerous president and made more dangerous still by the fact that those charged with analyzing him cannot name his essential nature because they too are implicated in it. And you go on to say that the world has handed over, the most powerful country in the world has handed over all of its affairs, the prosperity of its economy, security of its citizens, the purity of its water, the viability of its air, the safety of its food, the future of its vast system of education, the soundness of its national highways, airways, railways, the apocalyptic potential of its nuclear arsenal to a carnival barker. And I think in some ways we're kind of seeing some of the effects of that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> <You think so. laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think, um, well, I, I, I just want to back up um, to, to the point you just, you know, uh, made. Um, first of all, it's nice to be here with all of you guys. Uh, nice to be here with Heather. And uh, despite our, our banter, uh, nice to be here with, with, with my editor and publisher. <laughs> um, but, but Chris, you know, you, you asked this question about, um, or you, you made this point about uh, certain folks, uh, writers, intellectuals, what have you, um, who would like us to stop talking about race. And, and I would submit that it is not us who began this conversation. Um, when people frame it that way, um, they make it seem like you are taking the initial action. You are the one that is introducing uh, 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 factors and ideas that would not be there if you would just, you know, hush up about them. But, you know, what, what I would submit is, you know, when we see a COVID outbreak, uh, Rikers Island, um, that, that is this society talking about race. Uh, when we see... Uh, 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 hotspots, coronavirus hotspots in Cook County Jail, that is this country talking about race. Uh, when we see, as, as, as you pointed out earlier, uh, the coronavirus uh, seemingly magically uh, landing with, with, with disparate uh, impact in, in places where black and brown people live, that is this country talking about race. 
what people really want is they don't want us to reply to that. They don't want us to answer back. They don't want us to have a response, but they're having a conversation. Um, they're having a conversation with the language of power. And, and the language of power tends to leave bodies around. Um, and it is historically not like the response. So I, I think it's really, really um, important to be clear about it. And, and, and they're not just having the conversation in, in, in that, that, that language of power and bodies. I mean, I mean you, you had a president who wanted to call this uh, uh, the Wuhan, uh, Wuhan virus. Chinese flu or, or, or whatever it was, and threatened to actually hold up uh, uh, an international agreement unless racist language could be put into the agreement. And so I, I think it's really, really important to be very, very clear about who has started this conversation and, and where we stand within it. Right. Well, Heather, it's interesting because, you know, I think in your work, what I've, one of the things I think is um, so kind of bracing about it is that uh, you do acknowledge the ways in which, you know, all these phenomena fall most heavily, of course, on people who are poor, people who are black, um, but you do also trace the lines that, you know, begin in the suffering of black communities to the larger society. Like, you know, you talk about this in the case of the 2008 uh, housing crisis. Um, and uh, how do you think that kind of um, uh, factors into like the, the situation we're seeing right now? You know, um, that metaphor of the pool, um, it's, it's about really all being in and a question of are um, white Americans willing to be in the same pool with us, right? Um, and that is actually a term that's used very often in healthcare, where whether you're talking about an insurance pool, right? You want the, the largest number of people in the pool um, so that no single person's risk um, uh, you know, ends up, you know, costing too much. Or when you think of things like vaccines or public health um, interventions, you actually want the largest possible number of people and you are only as safe as the most vulnerable. So when you look at, for example, what we did on healthcare um, in 2009 with the Affordable Care Act, you know, it. 20 million more people have health care than they did. I mean, just a tremendous um, victory that the first African-American president uh, accomplished a hundred years almost after it was first attempted. And yet all the ways that it really would have been about everyone getting in the pool together, whether it was the government negotiating drug prices or of course, any kind of public option or expanding Medicare, um, that is where the white majority was wholly resistant and still continues to be resistant to the very idea of expanding Medicaid to working class people of all races all across the former Confederacy. If you look at the maps of the places that have refused to follow John Roberts' logic when he said, um, it's okay for states to refuse to expand Medicaid as part of this law, he claimed states' rights again. And look who responded and, and said, no, we won't share um, across lines of color. Um, and there's research that shows that the more black people who live in a state the more likely it is that the white people who live in that state are to oppose the expansion of Medicaid. And so healthcare really is about being connected. And so this is absolutely where you see the inability of white America to shed the belief in a hierarchy of human value, come back to make us all vulnerable. Because kid not, we are still all vulnerable. It is true that on Navajo plantation, um, excuse me, Navajo reservations in Indian country right now, there are incredibly rampant over, over, um, over incidences of, of COVID and that the biggest hotspot in the country is Cook County, um, not far from where I grew up. But it is also true that you have tens of thousands of white Americans falling ill, losing their jobs, 5.5 uh, million people going on, on unemployment, businesses that'll never recover. So like the financial crisis, which started out as predatory loans to credit worthy black homeowners who were already homeowners. This is a stereotype I, I try every time I can to refute for people the idea that it was black and brown folks getting into houses they couldn't afford and should never have been in. 
that poison started out being tested out in our communities. And then once the greed machine took hold of it, it spread out to the wider, whiter mortgage market. And I think that's what you're seeing today. Yeah, and no, I thought you had a great line in your talk where you said that, you know, it wasn't uh, the people, it was the loans. The loans were the problem, you know, and uh, by trying to say it, it was isolated somehow in some stereotype of like who those people were who were receiving the loans, you missed the actual issue, which is one of those sort of frightening things, I think, when, you know, even with what's happening with the virus, when people start to try to name it according to different communities, <laughs> because you can kind of see how that process has worked historically. Like if you can say, crack is a problem for black communities, then you'll see the response be a certain kind of response, you know? Whereas if you say opioids are a problem in general, you know, in you know, the heartland, you see a different kind of response. And, um, and it's a scary thing. And that kind of just brings me to another question, which is about like how we kind of shift the conversation. And Tanahasi, I know you and I've talked a lot about the idea of how we change narratives around, um, around the conversation around race and, and equality and belonging and identity um, and how important that is to, to as, a, as a part of the process of changing um, the larger systems. And you, I know right now are working on um, fiction right now. What, in a moment like this, um, do you feel like this is at all like becoming, and of course your last novel was a, your last book was a novel. Do you feel like there is a mm, responsibility or a role you have as someone who's creating uh, fictional worlds to kind of try to respond, to lead, to imagine us into different futures or help us think about our past in a different way? Yeah, I, I think um, I think we have a very limited uh, view of, of politics uh, a lot of times in our, in our conversations. Um, and I think we have a, a almost um, ballot centric view um, of, of politics, which is to say politics that, that really centers around uh, the, the act of voting. Now, now, the act of voting is very, very important. Um, so it's not that it's not important or that it, it should not be done. It's not that this year it isn't, you know, uh, uh, consequential, um, but it's like brushing your teeth or taking out your trash. You, you got to do it. It's a duty. But that's not the end of your duties. And that's not the end of, you know, what, what, what one would call good, good hygiene, um, if I can torture the metaphor. Um, and, and so I think I think a lot of times we don't really think about how we got to the point um, or how we get to a certain place in a ballot box situation where we are not necessarily all that enthused about who, who, who we have to vote for in, in the first place. And I think a lot of that is all of the politics that happens beforehand. Um, the, the example I, I think of, you know, right now that I think is, 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 is playing out. Well, let me just start with, 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 with a pretty, you know, um, flat out statement. We, we don't in this country regard black people as human beings, okay? We, we just don't. I mean, we don't, we don't, and you can see it in how the conversation is taking place right now around, around coronavirus, okay? Um, I have heard uh, countless numbers of people say, um, sometimes black, in fact, very often black, that part of, if not the whole reason why this is hitting us the hardest is because of our, our habits. We are not social distancing. We don't eat the right foods. We are doing all, all of these little individual things. It, it has been fascinating me to, to me to, to hear this and to watch this at the very moment that I see white people storming the state capitol in Michigan in defiance of a public health ordinance. Um, there is a way that we feel, or, or when I see pictures, for instance, right here in New York City, of white people at the farmer's markets or out in Prospect Park. Now, people express, you know, rage and, and they're upset with that. That's not what I'm saying. But when you have people literally dying, you know, in the Black community, those who have the least and the expression that it is somehow their fault, um, that, that's a piece of a very, very old dialogue and an old way of thinking about Black people wherein you make uh, systemic white failure, you know, as I was saying in the Instagram post, into somehow individual Black failure. The very fact that you only speak about Black people or only speak about other people who are not white in that particular way, I think, you know, again, it's a conversation about who you regard as human and who you don't. Now, where do we get those ideas from? And I would argue that, again, you know, in the politics that happens before you even get into a ballot box, before you even get to a policy, there is a conversation that is historically 
been happening and continues to happen in the art uh, and in the culture of this country. Um, Gone with the Wind is a, is a work of great politics and a, and a work of great political import. Birth of a Nation led to the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, these ideas about who is human and who is not have been repeatedly drummed into folks' head. And so you, you, you end up in a situation where, you know, you think you're in an intellectual uh, uh, debate or intellectual conversation, but because the culture has already asserted to you over and over again that you are less than, that you are not human, the conversation is already skewed. You, you, you can't have a, a conversation on logic and facts when somebody already, you know, regards somebody else as human. And, and so to, to the extent that, you know, um, obviously I, I like writing fiction, you know, I, I enjoy it very much, but also, you know, view it as, as, as the logical extension of, of, of my politics. And that is to, you know, render uh, uh, black people as human beings, you know, um, um, render their, their, their history, their culture, their struggle as, you know, uh, equal as, as, as humans and as, as worthy of the same, you know, respect and belong on the same level of, of conversation. Um, so that we don't have situations where people are, are, are quite literally, you know, falling down and dying in the streets and we're having, you know, some conversation about pop pop and, 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 and you know, a, a big mama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Heather, you know, you've also talked a lot about uh, how we can kind of see our way through this and how it's, um, it is a complex thing. It's not simple enough to have like policy solutions if you don't, in some ways, you know, there's almost like a spiritual or cultural kind of dimension to, I think, the work that we have to do as a country. Yeah, I am. Um, so for, um, you know, almost 20 years, I was working in uh, public policy in trying to rewrite the laws and successfully in many cases rewriting the laws around our democracy and our economy, whether it was financial reform, credit card debt, bankruptcy, um, voting rights laws, campaign finance laws, um, because you know, in my heart, I'm a wonk. I wanna change the rules that dole out power in our society and put more of them in the favor of more people. And yet, um, and I became the president of a think tank when I was 33 years old, right? And it was, um, you know, in many ways, like the, the biggest, best job I could have in that world. And after um, about half a decade there um, at Demos at the helm, it, I kept running up against, and in many ways, the, uh, the, the depositing of, of a carnival barker um, in, into the White House was um, the last straw on this, but I kept running up against the fact that we are not healed and that we can continue to write different laws, but laws at their core are just expressions of beliefs. And when you change the laws to say that we must sit, we can sit by side by side and learn side by side and drink from the same fountains and enter the same doors. Um, if you haven't changed the esteem with which the white majority holds us, you will find mountains being moved in order to continue that separation. And, and that's what we have, right? We are as segregated in our in our school system as we were before Brown. We have an entire new category of private schools that did not exist before Brown. Um, we have private everything that did not exist um, before integration. And so I, you know, I'm I'm a deep believer in the power of, of the dream and the power of the dreamers and the power of fiction and in fact speculative fiction. Um, you know, my 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 mother who taught me everything I know, um, she saw Black Panther in the theater like four or five times. And um, <laughs> she came out and she said, Well, now I know how white people feel. Because I spent just two and a half hours seeing <laughs> myself and us as the heroes, and I think I can conquer the world. And I similarly, I grew up as a science fiction and fantasy nerd, and um, you know, I just the first time I, I sat there in in the scene um, when Shruti is 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 like you know d being the one to save the day. The nerdy black girl is the one to like put the action in place that saves the day tears were rolling down, down my face in the darkness 
because I just realized how much all of my imaginative life with you know just a few exceptions I had had to project into a white male body as hero in order to end the story. Um, so I think it's extremely important. And I also think that politics matter. And I think the storytelling, I think we have so much that we can learn about this moment, um, particularly because someone who is a, a, a worker of fiction, which is Donald Trump, right? The fiction of his own wealth, the fiction of his piousness, the fiction of his intelligence, the fiction of his business acumen. He is a reality star, a marketer, someone who slaps his name on things. He knows about the dreamers and the dream. That's actually that sort of cotton candy economy is what he has always actually trafficked in. And so we have to recognize that that politics is also about storytelling. It's about dreaming. It's about projection of who we want to be. Um, and the most powerful force in our politics has always been and still is this question of who we think we are and who we project um, that that sense of identity onto in terms of our political leaders. So you know. I, I, I'm not going to say anything right now about the presidential race that's uh, that we are with at this moment, um, but I do believe that there is so much room um, for um, there's so many spaces in between politics, policy, and culture um, that that we we have to occupy them all if we're going to make change. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just want to just if I could just. Uh, if I had the emojis, I would do the applause with the, with the black hands and everything. Um, but no, I, I just I just think that's so on point, man. Yeah, exactly. I think that's so on point. Um, you know, and Chris, you know, like I had a, I had a very, very similar moment, man. I mean, like you would, I would, you know, when I was at the Atlantic, um, I had great editors and I had great fact checkers. And so if I was gonna write something about, you know, reparations at the Atlantic, you know what I mean? Like I was gonna make a case for reparations or any number of things at the Atlantic. Everything had to be right to a T. You know, they put five, as they should, I'm not saying I resent this, but five fact checkers on the story. Everything has to be right and you know it and you get it down and you can document it to people. And they just, <laughs> you know what I mean? They just don't, they just don't, they don't want to hear it. I mean, to, to probably even bigger than that was like when I, you know, and this still has had, you know, impact on me to this day was doing the research around the Civil War and you could literally show people the documents wherein Southern government said, this is why we are going to war. <laughs> or you go so far as to say, like you could show them letters because this exists of people saying, there are people who are saying we are only going to war for states' rights. No, we are going to war for slavery and the record needs to be clear. And they, they don't want to hear it. So that's not a logical argument. You're not, you're not going to change policy. I mean, and, and again, I want to be really, really clear about this. I'm not denigrating policy. I'm not denigrating. I'm putting it within the context of other things. I'm saying that it doesn't exist in this place alone, uninfluenced by other ideas. If I think you're a dog, the laws of, 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 human, of hu humanity do not matter. They have, no, they have no reference or any sort of anything. If I think you're a dog, if I think, you know, you are, you know, uh, 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 a Kenyan Muslim in America, not there's anything wrong with being a Kenyan Muslim in America, but if I think you're a Kenyan Muslim to the point that I don't think you're a legitimate president, you can pull out your birth certificate, your long form, your short form, you can do whatever you want in front, it, it doesn't matter. And we see that because the guy who said it is now president. Right. We see it, 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 alter, it, it, it doesn't matter, people you know, believe and so, you know, the flip side of that, of, of what Heather was just saying, which was so powerful about Black Panther that, that, that I have to say, I mean, this is the thing, you know, I've said this before, the thing that gives me the most hope and the most optimism is actually the arts and culture, because there are six, seven, eight-year-old white boys and girls who are also seeing Black Panther. Mm -hmm. And their vision of what humanity is, is consequently and will be consequently different. Um, it's not enough in and of itself, that's not what I'm saying but it's very, very powerful. We know how it worked on us to see, you know, heroes and have to, you know, see ourselves 
you know, through, 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 through white eyes. We know what that did to us. And this is, a, you know, the first time perhaps in American history was actually being thrown back and being thrown back in, in, in a really righteous way. You, you have to be, you know, hopeful about that. Yeah, so it's interesting. I was having a conversation earlier today with our um, executive editor, um, Elizabeth Mendez Berry, and she, we were talking about this idea about changing the narrative and what that really means. And she was saying how, you know, there's this idea that changing the narrative is changing a story, but really to change the narrative means to change stories, to change politics, to change points of, you know, activism, places where we pressure uh, governments and power. Um, changing the narrative is like this holistic thing that has to happen across the board. Um, and we're, when we're having this uh, discussion right now here at the Apollo Theater, uh, it's my first time being on stage at the Apollo, it's a special <laughs> night for me, but, um, but you know, the Apollo, like a lot of the cultural institutions right now is closed down and is um, uh, imperiled in some ways, you know, like a lot of cultural institutions are by not having not being open, we see this in the biggest cultural institutions. We see like the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, things like that are that are starting to uh, really feel the sting of what's going on now. And I'm wondering, you know, because culture is so important to what we're doing, I wonder um, what in this moment, what culture do you feel like is nourishing you? Mm. And don't say Tiger King. <laughs> what culture in this moment? You go first. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, if anybody can see what's back here, it's a, a bunch of uh, hardbound uh, comic books and Dungeons and Dragons and uh, <laughs> Black Panther up there and there's a, um, a Captain America hat. Um, and uh, it, it's funny because uh, it's, it's weird, man. I mean, we, 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 we're never in charge of who, um, where we get ideas from, you know, part of being black, and I guess part of being any um, any sort of you know marginalized culture, be you black, LGBT, women, whatever, uh, anybody who's you know had to look at society from the outside is even if you are looking at a world that was not built on the rules and the idea that you yourself are human, you you find yourself taking lessons from that anyway. Um, and so, you know, I've, you know, as a child and, and even to this very day have come to um, hold the world of, of comics, you know, very, very important and very, very close to me. Um, it, it was the first place where I actually saw, you know, a, a black woman who, who, who was a hero in, in Storm and the X-Men. I was like nine years old, you know, and, 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 so, and I'm actually writing, you know, her in little bits, you know, in Black Panther right now. Um, and so the comics industry, man, I mean, I, I, I enjoy it, you know, about three people read it, but you know, that, that's, that's also beautiful too. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, I feel like I got all my little toys and I'm just bashing them back and forward in my, in my room, you know what I'm saying? My little action <laughs> figures like a kid again, except everybody's black. Well, not everybody, because I write Captain America too, right? And, and, and that's fun too, you know, being able to ask questions about gender, uh, about identity, you know, to think about the, the, the president of the United States, actually, you know, from, from different um, uh, 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 perspectives. So, you know, even if um, I'm not, I guess, writing in, in the most widely distributed places, you know, right now, I, I, I am writing and I'm, and I'm, you know, and I am drawing great sustenance, you know, from the reading and, 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 and writing, um, that, 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 that I'm doing right now. That, that probably would be, I, I, I do gotta say, you know, I know this is probably not on topic that the comics industry is in a, in a very, very bad place right now. Um, and so I don't know if we have any fans among this, this, this 500 uh, people in this room who are fans of the industry, but some of, you know, our, our greatest creators who have made me, you know, possible in, in, in the first place, you know, um, are seeing their livelihoods uh, endangered and, and imperiled and, and, and we are feeling uh, for them right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Heather? So um, if you can see what's behind me in this library, which is actually my mother's library, but we have a big overlap. It's um, like, you know, race books. <laughs> and that's what I'm reading. And it's not giving me, um, <laughs> it's not giving me any of that joy and lift and escape um, because I'm still in the, in the drafting um, and very much in the, in the moment of, of just being fully in these ideas right now um, about race and inequality 
um, about our story as Americans. I'm fully in nonfiction. I haven't read fiction in I don't know how long and I'm suffering from it. But music, music right now, um, I, you know, I also just mostly listen to people from, from some from before I was even born. I listen to a lot of Richie Havens right now. I listen to Curtis Mayfield, obviously went back on a, on a, um, on a, on a Bill Withers whole journey. Um, you know, I listen to a lot of reggae. Um, yeah, I'm not watching much. Everyone's like, what are you streaming? I'm like, I have a toddler. I'm not streaming anything. He goes to bed at nine o'clock and then I'm washing dishes and getting back to work. So yeah, sadly, no. Yeah, it's funny. I was telling Tanasi a while ago that I was listening to a lot of gospel music now, um, which I don't normally listen to a lot of. And I'm not, I would say, a devout believer to uh, understate the, the matter a little bit. Um, but it has been interesting thinking about uh, the kind of music that, or the kind of culture that kind of feeds you in moments when you feel a little bit of uh, despair out there. And it's interesting, like how there's these two different poles. Like, I think one is, like ta was saying, like there's this kind of, and you're both like, <laughs> which is interesting because you're both writers. And this doesn't surprise me that the culture you both describe is the culture that immerses you further into your own work. Um, working with a lot of writers, I, I know that the answer is usually my work in some way, no matter what the question is. Um, but uh, but it's interesting that there are these two pools. Like part of it, I think what a lot of us want to do right now is focus on um, our imaginations, you know, in the sense of trying to imagine our ways into different worlds um, or into worlds that our own world could be, or use our imaginations to try to figure out like the dynamics of the world we live in today. And others of us, I think, are really about like trying to hyper examine the world as it is right now. Um, and you know, they're not actually poles, they're kind of like sides of the same coin. And I think a lot of us go back and forth between them. Um, but right now, are you thinking about where we go from here? Um, are you thinking about what's on the other side? I feel like probably we're very early in this, but um, have you been giving that any thought? Well, I think we, we have to, I mean, um... This is a, a cracking open of much of what many people believed to be American greatness, right? The fact that we can't get some tests together, we can't get some masks together, we can't get some gloves together. The fact that 25 million people could go without from jobs to no jobs like this. The fact that essential workers are now grocery store clerks and bus drivers. I mean, this is a world undone. And so it is absolutely, I believe, our responsibility to move into the what has been created, that space is, that's been created uh, in the cracking open and and move things permanently, like get down to the foundations. You are seeing a party that had no interest in spending our money on anything but tax kickbacks to the wealthy saying here's $2 trillion. Now, granted the Senate Republicans still made sure to make sure they put more little tax sweeteners into millionaires in that, but you're seeing Republicans supporting a guaranteed income. You're seeing uh, bipartisan support for paid sick leave. Um, you know, we have bills for essential workers bill of rights that is not just nurses and doctors, but actually, you know, gig workers and delivery drivers. Um, you are seeing uh, the, the level of support right now among the American public for a rent strike to be you know, over majority, the highest ever support for Medicare for all as you know, 5 million people woke up and suddenly didn't have healthcare because that job that they felt so secure in was gone. So people are realizing that having your job uh, tied to your ability to, um, to see the doctor is maybe not a good idea. So, we have no excuses not to be not only dreaming of another world, but fighting for another world, articulating it and saying, you know what, the, the, the neoliberal consensus that privatized and individuated and atomized everything to the point that we can't do anything together, even protect ourselves, mm -hmm. has fallen apart. You know, Margaret Thatcher said, you know, there's no such thing as society will. Right now there absolutely is. We are only as secure as this society is. Um, and so I think this is absolutely, uh, the there's absolutely the possibility of a brand new day. 
um, and you are seeing tectonic shifts in public opinion and a desperation because I think for the, you know, if, if, if we are, if we fight like heck, there will be a, um, a changing of the guard in Washington and there will be a new administration that for the second time in 12 years is inheriting, you know, the brink of a great depression, if not that. And so the question is, you know, are we talking about guaranteed income? Are we talking about a national jobs act? Are we talking about just fully, fully changing the social contract, but this time to include everybody and not exclude anybody based on a false belief in a hierarchy of human value? I think that's what's on the table. I absolutely think that, you know, the time for reparations in all its form is absolutely going to be now. I, I don't see what what more calamitous thing could be delivered to this country. How much how much more we need to be sent back into our rooms and think about what we've done aliens, aliens, in this moment. What did you, you say? Aliens, an alien invasion. An alien invasion. An alien invasion. All right, you, you make that happen. Ronald Reagan was always talking about the alien invasion that was going to bring us together. Uh, I just have one more question. Then we have a few questions from the audience that I'd like to get to because there's a lot of them and um, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. But so it's interesting what Heather was saying because, you know, I think, and I mentioned maybe this to you before that I think there's a lot, like I feel a lot of the same ways. Um, but I do wonder how much we, um, you know, there's other people who feel like their own ideas about how American society should be organized have been affirmed by what's happening right now, you know, but from the other, from the polar opposite end of the political spectrum. Um, so do you think, uh, like, and this is a tricky question, but has there been anything that has happened over the course of this crisis that has surprised you, like not affirmed the thing you already believed, but actually made you think about something in a new way? Surprised me? Um, probably so. I'm having trouble thinking of it because you kind of put me on the spot. That that doesn't mean you know, like <laughs> if I thought about it, I, I would. Um, I guess what I want to say is I I I really hope Heather's right, um, and I don't mean that in a sarcastic. Yeah, okay. Like sort of hope she's right. So sort of, like I literally hope Heather's right. Um, but um. I think whiteness is a very powerful idea. Um, I think roughly 35 to 40% of this country, um, at the very least, the best you can say it of, is they do not think being um, a bigot, uh, being a racist, being a, a, a sexist, they, they don't think that's a disqualifying feature for being leader of the three of the free world. So you start there. Um, that, that would be hard. That, that would be hard no matter what. Well, then you look at the opposition party. And this is basically the fundamental operating position of, of the opposition party. Uh, if you want to have any sort of um, power in, in the Republican uh, Party today, you, you have to be a Trumpist, period. There's, there's no, you know, a uh, small C. Conservative. The Conservative Party is actually the Democratic Party. Uh, and I mean that in the sense that the party that is actually fighting for status quo America, as you know, Joe Biden said, go back to what we were before that. That's actually the, the, the Democratic Party. Um, uh, uh, the Republican Party is a reactionary party, um, a, a destructive party, a party that you know, seeks to you know, destroy, literally destroy the institutions of America. That's what happened. That's, that, that is what the past four years have been about. They've been an assault on uh, 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 American government and, and, and institutions. So you have an opposition party that is in itself Trumpist. You know, the, the party as a basic plank says being a bigot, being a racist, being a sexist uh, is not a disqualifying feature for being leader of the free world. Now, now, when that, now see, that's very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous because what that means is when you, you know, say, you know, being a, 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 a white male, uh, uh, is, is a force for elevation within the party. You, you end up with people who tend not to be the best qualified and most intelligent, you know, and, and, and most uh, 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 well-trained folks to, 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 to do the job. Um, so you have somebody like, you know, I, I can't, I'm blanking on it, on it. Kelly Comer, yeah, yeah, earlier, earlier, a uh, couple, couple days earlier, uh, not really knowing what COVID-19 means. Um, and yet speaking to, 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 
Americans about. This is very, very dangerous. And then on top of that, you have a, a country that is fundamentally uh, uh, lurching towards American apartheid. What do I mean by that? I mean, while I salute the victory in, in Wisconsin, I, I really do. I think it's it, you know, absolutely incredible people fighting their asses off. But folks literally had to risk their lives in mm -hmm. order to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and that's a, that is a preview of what you should expect in, in, in November. And so you, you have a, a voter ID law that I believe just passed in Kentucky. You know, you have the forces of a man, you have bone deep stuff like the Senate itself, the Electoral College itself. It could be that Donald Trump could lose a majority again and, and you know, still, you know, Sorry, I muted myself. I must be going on. <laughs> Still managed to prevail. That's me telling me to shut up. <laughs> the, the point I'm trying to make is um, it would not at all shock me if that minority, um, that energetic minority, that, that critical mass that holds whiteness close uh, through undemocratic means that are enshrined in law and in our constitution, um, manage to hold on to power. I, I hope that's not true. I hope that we do value competence. I hope we do value having tests and, you know, having the mask and having, you know, ventilators. I hope we do. I really, really hope we value that more than we value white macho. But it's not yet clear to me that, that the country as, as constructed right now does. Yeah, it's interesting. I do think that um, I feel very much, and I've been talking to like a lot of our writers who are kind of grappling with this in various ways. There is a sense that, you know, we are at a crossroads and um, and we've been at crossroads before, even in our lifetime, we've seen like 9-11 and other moments that seemed like everything will change in this moment. And we saw like in 9-11, everything did change <laughs> in a way. We've had 20 years of, uh, of war, increasing inequality, um, and uh, surveillance and collapse of civil liberties and rising of ethno-nationalism. Um, and so we're at another crossroads. And I think Heather, I think you make an excellent point. Like we're at a crossroads and this is the moment where we have to fight to make sure that we go down a better road um, and not just sort of let ourselves drift back into, because other people are organized, other people are ready um, to fight. And I think we have to be too. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, turn to a question from the audience. Um, I don't have the name of the questioner, I'm sorry. Um, but, well, this is an interesting question. At the recent protest in Michigan against the governor's public health orders, some people brought Confederate flags. How is the Civil War relevant in a Northern United States Capitol in 2020, particularly around a uh, protest around uh, legislation? Now, so you can write about history in your books a lot, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna say both of you, uh, there's a lot of really interesting history in your work. Um, so how, how is the Civil War relevant to a uh, protest in 2020 in Michigan? I, of course they brought Confederate flags. It, 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 it makes, <laughs> I mean, it, it makes, to anybody who thinks that uh, that protest is uh, some sort of principled objection uh, to mm -hmm. public health uh, is wrong. I mean, the Confederate flag is the symbol of, uh, of, of triumphant whiteness. Um, that 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 triumphalism. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's exactly you know what it is, and it should come as anybody who lives in any black person certainly that lives in, in, in Detroit or lives in Michigan or lives in Lansing knows you know uh, uh, full well uh, that triumphalist whiteness is not you know does not end at the, at the Mason Dixon line. I mean Detroit, you know for instance is a city where you know during the 1960s they literally firebombed black people uh, uh, to keep them from moving you know, uh, uh, out of, out of, you know, in, 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 into better housing. And so, um, you know, that you would have folks who I think we can go so far as to say, you know, a, a Trump aligned, a Trumpist, a Trumps themselves, um, would then fly the flag of, 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 of white supremacy. It makes sense, it's appropriate, I salute them. They have the right flag. <laughs> so Heather, it's interesting because you, um... Uh, also, you, know, you do write a lot about history and the historical roots of this. Do you think that an event like this, I mean, is there ever a point where we can say, okay, this marks the end of a certain arc in our historical story that we, maybe we can find a way to like start from a new page? 
it's more like waves, you know, it really is. And also we're so damn young. This country is so young. I mean, you know, talk to, I mean, we're just so young. I mean, I don't think we can, I don't think anybody on this call is going to live to see the time when we can say, okay, the founding era is over, right? It, it, I mean, it's, we're just really young as compared to so many societies with the ambitions of ours and the impact of ours on the world. So no, um, I will just say about those Michigan protests, um, absolutely plus one to everything that ta said, you know, of course and of course, but also know, also follow the money. Also note that it was a number of billionaire funded astroturf groups that organized that, right? To give Trump cover to reopen the economy, right? To get the stock market back, right? You always have to follow the money. Um, you know, I say in my talk that I am more interested just because I'm a systems person in, in, in holding accountable the people who are selling racist ideas for their own profit than I am those who are desperate enough to buy those racist ideas. Everyone is guilty, but in terms of where we can really make change, is it going to be, you know, someone who drives his car up to the you know, to the Capitol and honks his horn and waves a flag, or is it going to be the billionaire who organized the whole damn thing and is actually the one who's got Trump on speed dial? Hmm. That's interesting. So um, I would say that was one of the more chilling <laughs> photographs of this of this whole era, which has been full of chilling photographs of various kinds. Was you know those people planting their faces on the window of the uh, of the state house um, in protest. Um, because I think, again, it was a reminder that, you know, there are like forces that are organized and that are already trying to claim and direct like, you know, the narrative around this, you know, so which and is what- they were breathing each other's air faces this close. It's crazy. No, it's not They crazy. will get no, sick. It, it totally makes sense. It's, they will get sick. Yeah, it totally makes sense. It totally, I mean, I, and again, you know, just to, just back to the, the confederate, like the thing, Whiteness is a suicidal way, murder suicidal idea. Um, I am willing to take you down with me. That's right. You know, if, if, if I have to go, you know, I think, and I, I didn't even, this didn't even occur to me until I was, you know, thinking about it, listening to that. Heather, talk a little bit. Like, if you, if you take it back to the Civil War, you, you had big planners that owned, you know, like 500,000 human beings uh, who would happily inaugurate the war. And then you had people in that society who owned nothing, who were willing to go and die for it. That's right. Um, obviously on some level, I, I feel a level of sympathy for those who have less power and have less ability. Um, but I also don't wanna take away from the fact that those billionaires are racist too. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, it's not, you know, like, I think they might be selling what they believe. Not might, I think they are selling what they believe. Uh, and, and, and I think it's really, you know, in, in important uh, to remember that. I mean, it's a powerful idea, man. People do totally illogical things, you know? Uh, uh, in the Civil War, you know, they told folks, uh, used to these young, you know, boys, these young white boys in El Salvador who own no slaves. Oh, you'll be able to drink all the blood that'll be spilled, you know, in, in, in a thimble. I mean, this is a thing that, that, that was actually said, and you can see the spirit of that right yeah, yeah. Now, when people are doing something that's actually gonna wreak havoc, you know, wreaking uh, uh, I mean, havoc, yeah, yeah. yeah. havoc in South Dakota right now, right? you know, and, and I'll die for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to get another question in there. Um, uh, okay, uh, a simple but sincere question. How are you doing? So, uh, <laughs> been, you guys have not been at the state house uh, breathing other people's air, I assume. Um, so, you all have been uh, socially isolated for all this time. How 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 is that for you? you both obviously have like lots of things to occupy you um, in this time. You, all of us, are, I think, are among the most lucky in this uh, horrible situation. But what what has it been like for you? That's a really complicated question, I know, but. Jump in, please. It's a very um, kind question, a generous question. Um, 
I so I have a 19 month old son um, and uh, a small New York apartment and a mother who lives alone um, who's near 70 in in Maryland. So um, before the city uh, shut down, I live in Brooklyn. We live in Brooklyn, but um, we we drove down here to Prince George's County, Maryland, um, and that's where we've been. Um, it I'm an extrovert. I love people. I love spontaneous meetings and gatherings. Um, I love New York. I felt like I was abandoning the city. I still do. It feels wrong to not be there. Um, and I, and I, and I'm like the, but the, the psychic weight, I remember going to the grocery store before we left and just, and you know, I feel like I'm always talking about myself crying. I don't even cry that much, but like just in the aisles, it, people weren't freaked out yet. You know, it wasn't like a barren shelf type of situation, but I just felt the press of, of people's anxiety and of what was coming and how much we were going to lose and how many people we were going to lose. And it was, it was suffocating and also completely grounding in the enormity of, of, of what this was going to be. And this was March 13th. Um, so it's hard. It's not hard for me personally um, in terms of my money or my health. It is hard because I feel what is happening to us, us, us black people, us New Yorkers, us, us human beings, human fucking beings, excuse me, all over the world. Yeah, yeah, Anahasi? How are you? Um, I'm, I'm decent. I'm good. I'm good. I mean, I, I don't obviously I don't like it. You know what I mean? Um, but I'm here. You know, I have uh, you, you know, my wife, who I love. I got a, a 19 year old son who's home. Um, you know, love having him here. We're having you know the kind of struggles that you know probably would have if you're forced to live in an apartment with your with your dad who's you know used to doing things his his own way. Um, but but I think um. As a black person, you know, living in what is now the worldwide epicenter, and Heather, you were right to go. You got to live. You got. I don't think anybody should feel guilty at all. And I, you know, I mean that. Um, but but being here right now and being being black at, at the epicenter, um, I'm better than most. Um, I think that's really really important uh, to remember. What I, what I think about is, you know, I've been in New York, you know, almost twenty years now, and I was looking back, and, and I realized that. Apparently, a part of the New York experience is disaster. <laughs> Either it's a blackout, it's 9-11, it's, it's always something existential mm -hmm. happening. Um, and, and, and I'll just say, um, you know, and I think about this all the time, um, as somebody who has made a couple of jumps in, 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 in income or, or wealth, uh, relatively quickly, I can remember having to weather other disasters and having very little resources. Um, and I remember how much it sucked, how bad it was. Um, and so I am thinking about people um, who, you know, may not, you know, have had the good luck that, that, that I had. Um, I'm thinking about people even beyond that. You know, Chris, we talked about this. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about people who are managing mental illness. You know, um, I'm, I'm thinking about people who are in situations with abusive spouses. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, people who are, you know, in situations with, with, with substance abuse. This is a massive, massive betrayal by the state of its citizenry. Um, I understand that we should be wearing masks. I understand that you should be distancing six feet away. I'm, I'm doing all that. I understand you need to, you know, stay in the house. But I want to be very, very clear. We are left to fend for ourselves as individuals, and those of us who have more will be able to fend better. Those of us who, who have less will have you know, a harder time. This is happening because of a massive historic betrayal by the state. Um, it, it fills me with, with just rage uh, when I think about it, how people who have the most, who are appointed to, 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 to protect this country, uh, to protect its citizens, have left them as the citizen, as the president said, you know, uh, today find your own way, go for yourself to go. That, that's what it is. It's a go for Delph uh, government right now. Um, it, it is deeply, deeply infuriating. Um, I'm okay. 
um, I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure uh, about some of uh, my other folk here in New York. Yeah, this might be a good moment to, to bring up that we uh, also, you know, wanted to talk about a couple of organizations that um, if people want to get involved and um, support in this, uh, they, um, we encourage them to. Uh, Heather, I think you had a couple of uh, organizations you wanted to uh, point out. They're doing some work right now. Yeah, the um, Brooklyn Community Foundation um, has uh, a, a fund, a COVID fund that is, um, you know, Brooklyn Community F Foundation has a very race forward lens and they are um, funding communities of color, not just in Brooklyn, but in New York, um, direct funds to people, to caregivers, um, to nonprofit organizations to um, hold them up. And then the national bailout, which, um, collects bail money to get black mamas out and caregivers mm -hmm. out of out of jail and get them home in a place. Um, the, those are the two I would shout out. So Brooklyn Community Foundation and National Bailout, both of which you can Google. Great. Um, and uh, those of you who are in the Zoom, I think we have it also in the link that you guys can check out. Um, all right. Uh, well, you know, our hour is up, which is um, really too bad because I'd really love to keep talking to you guys more, but um, thank you so much for uh, for joining us here um, tonight. And uh, just a reminder, please watch Heather's TED Talk, which is, Heather's over here for me, which is amazing. Um, and, uh, and you know, really uh, as the beginning of her kind of articulating some of these themes that will be even further uh, developed in her book, which will be out early next year. And of course, ta work, uh, hopefully you already no, um, but uh, both his nonfiction and fiction, I think is essential, both in it's the way it's kind of, uh, it's certainly for me, it's been incredibly helpful to, to try to, as a lens to which to understand um, this particular moment. And in the fiction, I think uh, it's both, um, uh, you know, sort of edifying in that same way and clarifying in that same way, but also um, allows you to immerse yourself in something other than this world in a, a beautiful, work of fiction. So um, anyway, thank you both so much. And uh, okay. to everyone out there, um, this is the first of uh, uh, our One World kind of speaker series where we're going to have our authors coming and, and having conversations um, so we can stay connected with you know our community of readers in this time when we're all so isolated um, and talk about the things that uh, matter the most. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to the Apollo Theater for providing a venue for us here in these boxes. Um, and uh, good night. Good night, thank you. Thank you guys.